free episode, can I just note that because it's a bonus and you put B E eighteen, I can't help but hear the word bepisode. Bepisode. Bepisode eighteen. <laughs> I'm glad I got to cut this out. <laughs> She's given me the most wretched look. <laughs> I'm just saying that's what my brain produces. I can't help what... Tess, we are in control of what bubbles up from the subconscious. <laughs> Boy, do I know that with regards to you. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Statistically Insignificant Bepisode 18. This month, where I've seized the notes... This month, we're talking about the use of simulated data in scientific research. Now, I haven't written these notes, so I don't know what is covered here, but I'm going to guess that it's difficult to factor in things you're not aware of into a simulation. Yes. All right. Thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> to episode 18 of Statistically Insignificant. It's also very like difficult to beat all those Agent Smiths. Yeah, that's the particularly hard part of it. Yeah. <laughs> and every time as well. And just so much overhead. Yeah. But I anyway. write a whole intro to this about how we were actually in the Matrix. And Dean was online to our operator as tech support, very patiently talking them through why all of our guns had turned into water pistols. <laughs> exactly. Hell yeah. I have an alternate intro. Hi, welcome to episode 18. I'm in Baldur's Gate, a simulation <laughs> about how... <laughs> you want to be stepped on by a huge woman. I mean, depending on how she's stepping on me, yes. Some of the stepping-ons are quite lethal. I'd like to be sort of in the mid medium range. Okay, so, so bodily harm, but not death. Yeah, grievous bodily harm, fact, okay, but okay. not lethal bodily harm. Well, well the good news is you have a few saving rolls. I haven't played it, but I have just started Ghosts of Tsushima, so I, I'm pretty up to date, I think. <laughs> To be honest, I wasn't going to play Baldur's Gate, but Tess has got it and you can play multiplayer, so it's quite good. Ah, hell yeah. He has then probably gotten sucked into doing two, three solo campaigns. Just the one, Just and the then one <laughs> to make up for all the mistakes I made in the first one. Uh-huh. I have a love-hate relationship with the game because I'm a CRPG fanatic, and um, this one is fraught. What's the C stand for in CRPG? Classic. Oh, oh, Classic. Okay. Classic RPG. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Your, your Larian games, your Alcat Studios, your freaking... Bioshock, but sorry, Bioware before they... I was going to say, the, the original Baldur's Gate were Bioware. That's Bioware used to be ahead of the... Much like Blizzard, how far the mighty have fallen. Mm. I did a lot of research into what JRPG, like classic JRPG should play, um, <laughs> and downloaded one, and then have played like an hour of it and not gone back to it, so... Download Golden Sun. <laughs> Hell yeah. It was on the Game Boy Advance, it's really good, really easy to emulate, you'll love it. Nice. I am, however, because both of you apparently have time limits for how long you can stick around, despite the fact that you have probably wasted 15 minutes of the recording time just talking shit nice yeah, i fair. don't consider it wasting to spend time with my friend but <laughs> <laughs> but sure let's do the thing we're here for i uh, guess let's so this month we are indeed talking about the use of simulated data in scientific research on episode 18 no on bonus episode 18 <laughs> okay she can't cut it every time i say it if i say it so often <laughs> oh dear listener but i can i'm gonna substitute it out with different stupid words you've said okay fair enough yeah yep. so we're going to talk about what simulation is where it gets used and when it is justified and what that looks like as well as examples of the good and the very very bad because, boy, do I have some opinions about the very, very bad. Is this like um, simulate? I suppose you're going to give us an example, but... A few, in fact. I'm thinking, like, am I simulating... Oh, people like to simulate, like, population dynamics. Yes. With little, like, little dots and eat other dots. And yeah. And see what happens there. Yep. Am I, pre- am I jumping the gun if I ask, is that a good one or a bad one? You are jumping the gun, but the answer is, it's complicated. Oh, I hate complicated. I know, I know. And yet every time you voluntarily come on here and I talk about complicated things. I don't know if I voluntarily. Every time I try and get out of it, I'm, <laughs> I'm subjected to... <laughs> Guilt and shame. Exactly. Yeah. So, we'll see. So we're going to start with what simulation studies are. It's not you, listener, by the way. I do enjoy doing the podcast, just sometimes I enjoy doing other things more, such as Tears of the Kingdom. Or Baldur's Gate. Baldur's Gate. Well, I can't do that because that means my computer is on. <laughs> Not while I'm doing this. Tears anyway. of the Kingdom mean? It's a, it's a Zelda game. It's a Zelda oh, sequel right, yeah, to Breath yeah. of the Wild. So a simulation study is broadly defined. Some research that uses a computer program to produce data based on a model of what happens in the system. If we are thinking back to the framework that I have introduced before, where you have a real-world system that you're interested in, you have data that is typically measured on the system, and you have a model for how the system works, simulation studies don't work in that traditional way. I mean, they can, but often they do not. Typically here, your data is built by simulation out of a model. 
And based on basically an argument by analogy or an argument of reasoning, you build your model from your system using kind of a combination of a priori or reason-based arguments for why your model reflects the system, yeah. and sometimes like actual measurement. Stands to reason. I think I can see the problem so far. <laughs> well, I mean, there are better and worse ways to do this, right? What happens to the data beyond here depends on what you're trying to do with it. Like, Is this how you get shit like... Um bumblebees can't fly no that's just bad a priori science basically okay kangaroos can't jump etc etc yeah yeah because it turns out that an actual biological system behaves somewhat differently to the spherical cow in the frictionless vacuum that most physics basic physics assume white men can't jump yes yeah, Very somebody important. playing <laughs> somebody playing uh quop and determining that the human body can't can run in fact yeah run, exactly yeah, yeah. Well, my, I, mine can't. Quop is an accurate simulation of my ability to like a moat, but uh, it's not a universal model. Yeah. So one kind of basic assumption of why you would use a simulation study in particular is because there is emergent behavior. Yes. Yeah, well, that's meant to be you are. Everyone's favorite. Mm. From your rules of the simulation. I imagine the hope is that if your simulation is good enough, the emergent behavior will Reflect replicate the-, the emergent behavior of the actual system. Yeah, and one of the things you can ask is, does the emergent behavior mimic what I actually see in the system? Right, yes. Yeah, so emergent behavior, for those who haven't encountered the term before, is basically things that your system does that can't be deduced from just looking at the rules of behavior. One example of this is what's known as, I guess, cellular automata. So you can think of these as... The the lesser-known sequel. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, so you can think of these as like a, a field of maths that looks at how things behave over time when they are governed by particular rules, particularly when they're interacting with an environment. You can study this in a very kind of abstract maths way that doesn't look like anything you see in the real world, but basically you have something moving around or some behavior that is dynamic, which means changes over time, and the rules you input are pretty simple, but they say... Like if you've got like a grid, like this. Perhaps a more cogent would example would be that the technical rules of Monopoly don't include fist fighting your grandfather. <laughs> Which I'm sure you have done. <laughs> Which does emerge naturally out of simulating a game of Monopoly. So let's say that... You suck at tic-tac-toe. What the fuck's happening here? So let's say that you are the little, or you are looking at oh, the little, little circle with a cross is your little. cellular automata. I'm such a little cellular automata. It would be awful if something bigger. And those squares are so big. Yeah. There's a joke here. <laughs> and you are yet to find it. Let's continue. You can construct that yourself, listener. You can put that one together. So let's easy. say that your cellular automata here moves through this grid, and its basic rules for movement are move forward and change the color of the square you leave. What color? For example, here we have white. We'll call this one that I've drawn hatching in gray. And turn right on a grey square. Some game of life shit. Yeah, game of life. So literally, the the field of cellular automata was part of the game of life mathematical theory that arose, right? So these are relatively simple rules for behaviour, but you get behaviour out of this that you would not expect. Would this come from the sort of uh, pure mathematics tradition kind of thing? Cellular automata does, but it has actual like applications Right. In the real world. Well, so one example is you look at patterns on, a, on like, a conch shell. Yeah. And they ha- they wind up with, like, these kind of weird triangle sort of growing things around the outside of the shell that are cellular automata type patterns, mm-hmm. where the color of a particular cell's production of shell depends on what's around it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really, really cool. Hell yeah. Uh, another example is what's called the three-body problem. Oh, I've read that book. Yeah. The reason it's three bodies is because you get what's known as chaotic behavior. So in this context, you have basically three planets or three celestial objects, call them one, two, and three, and you're looking at the kind of orbital mechanics. So how do they all move kind of together? And this actually Uh, winds up being a chaotic system. Chaotic is chaotic in the same way as what we saw with the logistic map. A subtle change in the initial conditions, so where your three bodies start in relation to each other leads to quite radically different long-term behaviors. This is one of the reasons that it is described as emergent behavior here, because you can't necessarily tell what's going to happen long-term based on where you, you see, because you never have enough precision, things starting out, 
and the long-term behavior like one of your three objects gets flung off from the system into space, these may not be immediately observable from the initial rules, which are Einsteinian gravity, basically. So and chaotic the- in this context refers to huge variation in long-term behavior based on very small differences in initial conditions great so if you start your system like this you will see very very different long-term behavior to if the start of your object one for example was ever so slightly different over here yeah i gather that the three body problem for people who aren't familiar it works out that when you have three objects moving around each other using orbital mechanics unless you know the exact initial conditions it's impossible to predict it's it's impossible to predict outside a certain time frame right because your error blows up when small differences in the short term make huge differences long term right so this is one of the reasons that in our own solar system we don't actually know what the position of the planets will be let's say 3000 years from now because it's a complex enough system that we can't predict that precisely because the gravity gravitational interactions between the sun and the planets introduces enough complexity to do that. I reckon they'll be spinning around the sun. Probably. I'm going to put a guess out there. I'm going to put some safe money down on that one. But exactly where they are in that orbit and where those orbits are Mm. is less certain. Around the sun, probably. That's what we would call a qualitative statement, not a quantitative one, which is where exactly in an orbit something is. Mm. Fair enough, fair enough. Is that where the analogy of the butterfly effect or whatever, like a butterfly effect swings and like causes... Yeah, so the the butterfly effect is a, a kind of way of intuiting what chaotic systems look like yeah. in the sense that this small change a butterfly does or does not flap its wings results in a, a huge difference or a difference on a much larger scale there is or there is not a cyclone yeah the issue with that particular analogy is that it assumes that the butterfly is the only thing right. that is relevant to that change yeah when in fact the kind of total system of the atmosphere is at play there yeah so there could be other things other than that particular butterfly that lead to this happening or not. Anyway, that's a whole other discussion. Emergent behavior. Yeah, so we are particularly interested in this kind of emergent behavior because we can sit and think about the rules that go into building our simulation. I mean, that's part of building the simulation. But the kind of long-term behavior that that leads to is not necessarily obvious from just looking at the rules of things. There there is a long history of simulation studies. I would say that they've existed basically as long as computers, but have really exploded in popularity as access to computational power has exploded as well in the past few decades. Yeah, we started with like people sitting around going, hmm, I think it goes like this. (laughs) And given that I can imagine that, that must be how it works. Yeah, well, I'm pretty sure that the earliest stuff done with cellular automata, for example, was on punch cards. There are kind of a few fundamental questions that come into a simulation study, when you're trying to do properly anyway. The first is, why are you using simulation? Ah, laziness. I'm using it because I am lazy. I don't want to go outside and put on a hat. So, in particular, why are you using simulation rather than actual observations of something in the real world? I don't want to go outside, I just said that. (laughs) I know, dear. Yeah, I'm not not doing that. There's a sex joke to be made here, but I will refrain. (laughs) <laughs> that's stimulation studies <laughs> oh very good hey, hey i did my best okay how does your simulation represent the system and lastly which is deeply related to that what are you leaving out yeah i noticed in the classic simulation of a frog crossing a road frogger there's not many utes in that which i think <laughs> uh, really lowers the opportunities for frogs to cross the road by hitching a ride well i mean part of the challenge there is that utes are typically traveling parallel to the road road instead of perpendicular this was fixed in later games though like uh tony hawk's pro skater 4 you can uh hitch a ride with any vehicle on the road that's (laughs) true yeah okay so technology is improving (laughs) yeah absolutely i haven't gone outside so i don't know the state of all the frogs trying to get from one side to the other i assume that they're they're adjusting to the modern uh landscape maybe there's a kind of ride share service they can get involved in yeah it's called hopper oh where simulation studies are used is all over the place, from astronomy and cosmology, so like this three-body problem is something you do if you're looking at orbital mechanics, to medicine, computer science, social science, engineering, physics, quantum computing, the list goes on and on and on. Isn't simulating quantum computing kind of just adding an extra layer of complexity? Depends on whether or not you can actually build a quantum computer of the size you want. Well, how can, okay, how can you simulate 
a quantum computer that isn't just building a quantum computer? Well, because you have an understanding of, like, the randomness that occurs in quantum mechanics and how that would manifest in the quantum computer. So it takes, like, exponentially more traditional computing power to simulate a quantum bit. Right, right. right. But that means that you don't have to fuck around with liquid helium, which can be a saving. Yeah, given that uh, we're running out of that shit. We are running out of that shit. Soon those quantum computer scientists are going to be sitting around with normal deep voices. Yeah. <laughs> and then how are they going to get anything done? So our examples are going to come from ecology, uh, cosmology, socio-physical modeling, and quantum computing. The situations where simulations may be chosen, so this why are you using simulations, tend to be like places where it is expensive or impossible to actually get observational data. For example, we have yet to find a way to produce black holes to throw around. In theory, if you are able to produce black holes, you can in fact study their behavior. But oh. so far, the uh, Large Hadron Collider has not provided us with the end of our civilization. Yeah, the Ethics Committee is not allowing me to do this. Well, I mean, that is a different one, right? There are some situations where it would be unethical to do the experiments, or you want to use simulations in order to avoid suffering of lab animals and things. Will it blend? Babies! <laughs> you can't actually infect people with a disease these days to measure pandemic behavior. So, Oh, you can't, can you? Hmm. I want to tell that to the... Uh... To the uh, to the new world order <laughs> and their pandemic. Hmm. Well, no joke. The pandemic, aside from everything else, has produced a lot of data that will be studied for generations to come in, like pandemic modeling and things. A bit, imagine if the new order, order actually did that shit, their plan would rely on people being conspiratorial and not wearing masks and shit. Well, well, their, their <laughs> plan succeeded. <laughs> imagine you are the fucking like you're a disease researcher. A pathologist, what do you call them? Epidemiologist. Epidemiologist. And you're like, all this incredible data, then you have to contend with the fact that it includes a whole bunch of people who went out and got the disease deliberately. To own the <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's like, the fuck you! <laughs> well, I mean, this is a, a very real component. This is not the first time, right? You well, look back it's at emergent behavior, isn't it? Oh, why is it? That's fuckheads. <laughs> and this is one of the difficulties of using simulated data that doesn't incorporate social dynamics, because social dynamics are fucking hard, right? Yeah. And one of the things that tends to get left out of epidemiological models for disease is social dynamics, because we don't have a good way to model that in a computer. Yeah, just all your disease data just failing to account for, um... Dumb bullshit. Yeah, just, just the dumbest <laughs> bullshit. Yeah. Oh so my God. you can also use simulations if you are testing a method. So instead of saying, I am using this method to and the simulation to say something about a real-world system, you want to investigate how well the method performs in a very controlled environment. Because if you are simulating data, you have a high level of control over how that data behaves, which you do not have in the real world, and you can also get access to, if you will, true underlying values that are obscured by things like measurement data in actual observation. What do you mean by uh, true underlying values? Okay, so if I am simul- well, I'm going to talk about my own research as an example of this. So if I am simulating a tree that is growing over time, so we are looking at sizes over it's time. It's bigger. Typically, yes. But on top of that, I know the true sizes of those trees because I'm simulating them. I know the parameters of the growth functions that determine how those sizes change over time. And then I can add an idea of measurement error to those sizes. So let's say I have a true size of three and a half centimeters diameter. Mm -hmm. I add some sort of measurement error that gives me an observed size of 3.9 centimeters in diameter. My simulation retains that underlying information. In the real world, we assume that there is an underlying true value for the tree diameter, but when we sling a tape measure around it, we don't actually know that what we get is the truth. What we get is the truth with some amount of error because we have a physical process for measuring it. Right. How does that help your simulation to, to assume that? that I will isn't... talk about that in just a minute, don't worry. All right. So basically, the downside of a simulation is that it's not the real data, but the upside of the simulation is also it's not the real data. Yes. Okay, fantastic. And then you have to make an argument for why that helps. Okay, well, I, I'm, I stand ready to be convinced. So we have some ideas about how you can check for the broad quality of your simulation. First is... Does it match... Does it observed? match observation? Yeah. Yeah. Go out to the... Uh, match observation. To the field where all your trees are being measured and they're all turned into uh, inverted holes in the ground. <laughs> like, 
Well, ne- I, think the- I, put, I think I did random simulation wrong. Well, no, no. The more interesting idea is if you wind up with something that has negative size, we build models that cannot do that, right? Mm. But what does negative size mean? It's not physically possible. So what you're really causing is like an eldritch hole in the universe. Yeah. Which, admittedly, you'd say, I need to update my simulation. Or, holy fuck, this is cool, how do we do this? <laughs> Look, all I'm saying is this, if I manage to create the inverse tree, yeah, I should get tree. a fucking Nobel Prize. <laughs> the anti-tree. The anti-tree. Well, that's just the um, coal-powered fire st- <laughs> coal-powered <laughs> energy station, right? Coal-fired power station, that's the combination, yeah. Well, more specifically, it's the cattle field, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we can look at qualitative... The of a tree, a cow, that's yeah. the... <laughs> <laughs> so we can look at qualitative behavior, which is something like, does this occur, does this not occur? So, for example, in the three-body problem, one of your objects getting flung off into space, does that occur or does it not, is a qualitative behaviour to observe. Right, okay. We can also look at quantitative behaviour. Did you end up with an extra body? I know that's a qualitative one. Yeah. I just, because it says quantity and then I am, I see, it referenced a number, mm-hmm. and that's where the humour comes from. Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. If you could laugh, Bart, that'd be good. Uh, <laughs> sure. Ha 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 ha. Right, perfect, yep. Good. Well, it would be good if you laughed, I think, <laughs> is the answer to that one. So, like, what I mean by quantitative behaviour is that you have some measurement on your system, and your simulated system is able to produce a replica of that behaviour. So in your trees, that might be a maximum height, mm-hmm. which you care about on a species level, because you don't actually see infinitely tall trees. You could, you could just, just does it look... Does it look a little sane when you run the model? I believe there used to be infinitely grown trees, but it went away with modernism. It's very sad. It's like giants. <laughs> yeah, well, the Tower of Babel is an effort to actually replicate yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, And sure. uh, we know that God got a little unhappy about that one. Mm. The quantitative the behavior workers. comparisons are particularly relevant if you're making claims about how much something changes. So if you are using your simulation model to make claims about the degree to which something changes or some measurement of behavior in the real world, which is not just does or does not occur, then you really need to compare the quantitative behavior quite directly. Yeah, I remember even as little as you know, five, ten years ago, people saying all these climate change simulations are ridiculous because they show it getting really, really hot in some places, really, really cold in others. So clearly they can't be true because yeah. that isn't going to happen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And now the joke is still on me because those people don't care that that's what happened. Or they think it's the second coming and that's good, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This doesn't always apply. For example, you might be examining the behavior of, a, of an actual abstract mathematical system, for example, your cellular automata, in which case there is not necessarily a real-world comparison that you want to make, because the observations are purely, if you will, hypothetical. They only exist in the theoretical space. Typically, though, in science, you do. Do you have a good argument for why the simulation reflects reality? My feet hurt. I don't want to go outside. It sounds right. <laughs> now, Professor, I know that my simulation indicates that the trees will grow so large that they will uh, anger the Almighty, wrap around the earth, and end all life. But I would like to argue that that is cool. Based and uh, tree pilled. Tree pilled. And so, therefore, I think that I should get my PhD and also we should work towards it, make it come true. I mean, like, people got, like, PhDs off, like, some pretty, like, faulty shit, right? Like, Well, no, that's not the example I'd compare this to. I would look at all the absolutely cooked units who believe in Roko's Basilisk and are now desperately trying to make the AI singularity happen. Right, yes, of course. That's why would a artificial intelligence in the same in a scale of like human intelligence, why would that necessarily be uh so vengeful cruel and vengeful, yeah. I mean, well, for one thing, if you are deeply misanthropic because you actually hate people, then it kind of makes <laughs> sense to you. But also these people are trying to hedge their personal bets in the case of a worst like situ- worst case scenario. These are people who have too much, A, they have too much time on their hands. And money. And money. So all they can do is imagine a fall from, like they're completely anxious about about consequences because they feel the instinctively that they fucking deserve them. And then B, these are people who all they can imagine is getting revenge on people who wronged them when they were, when they were slightly younger losers. So they can only theorize about a robot in the universe. It also, it also just secular Pascal's wager. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, I really do think it was a component that these are people who are obsessed with slights against them, and they can't imagine that an all-powerful AI would be above that kind of concern. They're like, well, I'm the most smart human, so the robot's definitely going to want my stupid petty fantasies, <laughs> but even more. Well, not, not just that, but they are so alienated from the, the idea that you can have a life beyond yourself through other people, that they genuinely believe that their only long-term as prospect of survival is to become immortal and or to become immortal through the AI somehow. I don't actually believe that's possible. Right, their, their ego can't conceive that they will end, and so yeah. their every, their every um, waking moment is trying to work out how, okay, well, given that I am going to live forever, because otherwise the universe will end, how do I uh, make that comfortable and and tolerable? And the one thing that bothers them most is the idea of consequences. Yeah. Hence, enter the fucking basilisk. I do think we've all been turned into people who whose egos cannot comprehend the idea of, of death. Ah, uh, well, boy, do I have some chemical alterations that can help <laughs> with that one. Well, but, like, remember Thatcher? Yeah. Was talking about, you know, when she died, that would be the end of the universe. These people, they really do just can't conceive of. They're, they're absolutely godless. These people, they're, they're demons, folks. They're demons. I'm going to get a glass. <laughs> right back. I told him in the time before you arrived, Bart, to go and get a drink. Yeah. And he said, no, I'll be fine. <laughs> so along with this idea of do you have a good argument for the mo model is my particular brand of what I will call... Uh, numerical paranoia. Does it make you anxious? If so, it's good. <laughs> yeah, but that's not a very good question for the person with the anxiety disorder. Because <laughs> the answer is yes, universally. <laughs> but what I mean by numerical paranoia is because we basically have to encode information in a computer as numbers. Does what you are doing, does what you are trying to model, actually behave like a number? So what I mean by that is you have an ordering on numbers, right? One is you really fucking hope smaller than two, which is smaller than three, and so on. In fact, this is what we would call a total order, in that for any two numbers, if they are not the same, one will be bigger than the other. So it's like a Pinchon novel where every character is paranoid, but all their paranoia has turned out to be true. <laughs> yes. The other structure about numbers is that you can measure distances on them. So, like, one and two are unit one away from each other, so are 512 and 513. So you can talk about distances with numbers in a manner that is not always meaningful for other data. My kind of er example of this is Likert scales. So you're strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree. See the episode, whatever the fuck that was called. From Many podcast. episodes, in fact, that one has come up. But when we represent these as numbers from like one to five, and then go on to treat those as measurable, this completely denies the actual experience of, I guess, having opinions and, and like a valence of opinions and a strength of opinion. Because what I consider to be strongly disagree versus disagree may not be the same as what somebody else thinks those are. And on a given question, they might strongly disagree on that. Yes. Fact. And on or a on a disagree on if we compare even two questions with my responses, those may not mean exactly the same things in terms of a strength or, or differences in strengths of opinion. Well, it's also like it doesn't take into account the meta. Like if you're answering questions, you might have motivations to answer in particular ways because like you want something or, be, or want want some, a certain outcome, or it might be that like I don't know someone's going to get fired if you don't say you like <laughs> their service or whatever it yes. is. Like so that is kind of a a bigger issue in the use of survey instruments and the use of like not not just like numerical surveys but asking people questions about stuff yeah because the data that you observe does not in itself contain the context yeah i'm gonna go back to ai because it keeps coming up right this is one of the reasons that ai as we have built it so far is not artificial intelligence because it can't understand meaning and context yeah. last on this list is that if you're making comparisons to the real world you need reasonable stats for those comparisons this is a kind of huge and very problem-specific question. Like, are the statistics you're using good? So we're not going to really touch on it today, but it's just like, as ever on a statistics podcast, I should be flagging that. Yeah. Now it's time for some examples. First is me tooting my own horn, <laughs> which is truly an athletic feat given my disabilities. So example one, my own research. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, for years she's been plugging numbers into the computer and she's worked out trees grow. I know. It's astonishing. The line goes up, but it's weird. You show me all these graphs, right? Yeah. Of your research, and the line goes up, but most trees 
grow straight up, yet all the lines you show me are on a slant. Do you think that that's a problem with your simulation, that the trees are all on an angle? I mean, straight up is an angle. Okay, that's true. <laughs> but it's more typical than the angle of what you're showing me. Look, if you've got to grow on a hill, you've got to grow on a hill. Okay, fair enough. And yep. all your trees are growing on hills then? Yes. Oh, come on, give me this one! <laughs> no. So my research, I am looking at tree growth. So tree size over time, where we have repeat measurements. So you have multiple observations from each individual that reflect their sizes over time. What I am doing in my research is developing a method that allows you to account for the fact that you have measurement error for sizes. So the size that you measure, as in the number that you get out, is not a true quote-unquote representation of the actual size because you have measurement error there. I am using simulation to test whether my method actually gets access or can reduce the impact of measurement error. So my simulations are of size over time. And uh, when we say size, does this mean like girth of tree? Diameter at breast height. So diameter 1.3 metres above the ground. Is this a particularly good representation of tree size? Depends on what you're trying to do with it. Uh, there's a joke in diameter at breast height. And girth. Yeah, I'm trying to put it all together. I know, and it's not working for my you. My diameter at breast height is often broader because of the breasts... Is that how we're going to do that one? No. But you want to take a crack at it? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, All right. So we add measurement I'll workshop ever. it. I'll come back next episode. We'll have an updated version. Okay, so our simulations are of size over time. I add measurement error, and I want Wait, to- you, you add error? Yes, because what I simulate is the true value. Oh, right, right, right. Yes, but yes. I don't expect to ever see that, so I add some noise. Very insulting to the people taking the measurements, depending on how much error you add. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so uh, it's, there's kind, a, there's of a, it's kind of a judgment on their competence. No, because you just acknowledge that it happens. Oh, the error is like in the uh, the realm of like three feet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have had an apocryphal tale told to me actually about um, a student commenting that a subject where they have to go out and measure a whole bunch of trees as basically practice to look at how the data manifests is just the lecturer using them to collect data. Which, in psychology, might be true, but the reality is that the ga- data that they gathered on tree size was so bad <laughs> that it, c- it was unusable. Hell yeah. <laughs> so yes, there are you know greater and, and, and lesser ideas of measurement error. Okay, okay. And in particular, one of the other data sets that I'm looking at applying this to is of fish. So capture fish, take a measurement, put them back in for sport fishing, recapture them, have right. another measurement. and you have to include the, it was this big factor. Oh boy, <laughs> do you? Yep. Did we do an episode <laughs> on fish sizes in that specific regard? We did have an episode on fish sizes yeah. and talking about capture, recapture data in ecology, yeah. This was with Jesse Black. Mm-hmm. Oh, wonderful. So once you have your simulations over size plus measurement error, the use of the simulation is to check, can we reduce error by using the method? And can we get access to growth parameters? So you're, so the idea is that by simulating the data with error included, you could potentially work out the factor of the real measurements that is Error. Well, no, we're not necessarily we're not necessarily making an argument that we can do it that directly. We are in, because I mean we may or may not have a model for measurement error that matches reality. Mm-hmm. What we are saying is that by applying the method that I have built, we can reduce the impact of measurement errors on growth estimates. So growth being like the difference in sizes over time. So you take your second size, you subtract off your first size, that's the amount that you've grown in the intervening time. If you just take the observation as written, you can actually have growth increments that are negative, even if you can reasonably assume, or even if you simulate, non-negative growth. Uh, can a tree shrink in the, the In about time? five years, you don't expect it to. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, so it depends on your observations, right? Because if you are observing a tree's diameter over a single day, or over a season, you expect some fluctuation with the availability of water and the the season and whatever else, right? Right. If you are looking at five-year increments, you do not expect that to happen. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the assumptions that goes into my model is that you don't have negative growth over that time period. Unless it, like, burns half to death or something. Thankfully, the forests that I'm looking at do not have fire regimes. Marvellous. Because, well, at least... Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> and that's an emergent behavior. That- <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> so if you think we have, like, our first measurement is 2.1 centimeters, 
And with measurement error, we can either have a posi positive error, which let's say goes to 2.3 centimeters, or a negative error, which takes us down to 1.9 centimeters. So this is uh, measurement one. Then our second measurement two, the true value is let's say um, 2.3 centimeters, but we have a, a negative error, let's say it goes to turn down to 2.1, or a positive of the same scale, which goes up to 2.5. Okay, so here we have kind of four combination or four possible observations across two things, right? So if what we actually observe is 2.3 centimeters, then 2.1 centimeters, right? That looks like negative growth, even if the true underlying size is increasing. Is that a scenario that is likely to happen? Like there would be growth? I have seen it happen. Even yeah. Though, like, yeah, yeah. So um, this is usually stuff you observe when you have trees that aren't growing very much. Yeah. Because if you have tree that's growing a lot, a small error in those sizes is not going to overcome the change. Yeah. So this is typically what you see with small individuals that aren't growing very much. Okay, so I can now see the point of the simulation here, because if you just had the measurements and something like this came up, you would have no way to account for it. What I am trying to do is justify the fact that my method can account for it. Right. Because there are other ways of dealing with this sort of thing, like you can just exclude all the negative increment. But which I, is I do I do by the process of you explaining this yeah. this measurement error, I can see the ways that a simulation yes. which is systematically trying to guess at an underlying true value. Well no, it's not or, systematically trying to guess. You know. Right, yes, you're, that's you're giving, the point. Yeah. I don't understand your research, but I can <laughs> looking at this, I'd say, okay, being able to think about that's this sort of shit looks way more uh It's easier if you have the simulation, yeah. Precisely. Yeah, because for example, with a simulation, you can get this and say, okay, these are the ones that are true that I know about, but what I feed into my model, what I feed into my method that attempts to reduce measurement error is the observations. The method never sees the truth. It's only afterwards where you compare the output of the method to the truth that you can say, yes, we have evidence that it reduces measurement error. I think that this is a reasonable use of simulation. I'm using it because I want to know the truth. I am adding measurement error that I can justify. My growth models are justifiable. I am not using it to make any claims about real world systems, just the method. And I am actually further validating my method with real world data. Huh. It seems a little coincidental that the podcast by Tess, uh, the, our official position is that her research is good. Actually, yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little bias there, I'm thinking. I know. So the weaknesses of this is that the simulated data is always cleaner. It's too perfect. <laughs> the weaknesses is that it's too good. And also that what I am doing assumes that I have a reasonable growth function. So it assumes that the thing that I use to describe sizes over time actually matches how sizes over time behave. Yeah. And my which is a whole other problem well. in the research. Yeah, my growth function is also reasonable and normal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's fine. It's, um, yep. So the next one that I'm going to talk about is another reasonable use of it, which is black hole merger simulations. Yeah, difficult to measure. Yeah. We sent some researchers in, but they haven't gotten back to us. <laughs> <laughs> so cosmology research, of which black hole mergers are a part, relies on simulations where we can't actually fling the objects around. Which, you know, I think that's fair enough. This is one of those physical impossibility sort of situations. Yeah. The equations that govern the black hole behavior have, in a sense of, like, Einstein's gravity have been studied for a long time. They have some reasonable evidence that they are supported. We have some ideas of the boundaries of where those apply, which is typically in black holes, so we're interested to see what happens there. And this produces real-world behavior and real-world predictions that we can actually compare to observations. So black hole mergers is where you get ideas around gravity waves. So these are fluctuations in how space and time are stretching that only occur when you have these two or more huge objects that are interacting in this way. And we find it difficult to observe these objects. Is that the kind of underlying assumption? Yeah, yeah. Well, directly observing a black hole is basically impossible. I mean, we yes. have like... Famously, every time you go to look at them, you get distracted by the film Event Horizon. Oh, good movie, that. <laughs> yes. 
Mm. Yeah, yeah, quite. <laughs> so, like, we have some composite photos of a black hole. Like, famously, one came out a few years ago, and it was kind of the first actual direct observational evidence that these things even exist. That was kind of the red smudge, wasn't it? Yeah, and that matched what we expected a black hole to look like yeah. based on simulations. Basically. Just from the name, red wasn't my first... Sort of guesses to be <laughs> there. Uh, I was go? just going to ask what a photo is in the context of like into like uh, interstellar, interstellar sort of like, distances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a composition of a whole bunch of different observations right. that is built by a large um, algorithm. Right. Basically, we have had more evidence since then, but we also have other evidence specifically related to black hole mergers, which is the um, I can't remember the acronym, but basically. There are instruments that have been able to measure gravitational waves, yeah. which are a prediction that has come out of these sorts of simulations. One of the reasons that this is justifiable, I mean, even without the, kind of the verification from gravitational waves and that sort of thing, is that the systems being you being simulated are relatively simple. What I mean by that is that up to mass, up to size and rotation speed, we assume that a black hole is a black hole is a black hole, right? That's kind of the only things that their their structure and behavior individually really depends on. Yeah, it does seem like the, the forces involved, while massive, and I'm sure there are emergent behaviors that I'm not considering, like gravitational acceleration, not that complex. Relative to something like a social system, yeah, yeah. where each person has their own long history that influences their behavior, physical systems are relatively simple. Yeah, and famously, black holes are singularities, which means you don't have to account for a lot of... Like, they are basically a point. Well, no. So uh, what is included in this black hole simulation, and particularly when you when you start dealing with stuff that's spinning, is the way that the event horizon behaves. Right, right. Yeah, so it, you don't just deal with them as point masses. But other things that don't contribute to this is, for example, we don't care what matter has gone into them. Mm. Whereas... In more complex real-world systems, anything like organic, for example, a lot of chemistry, well, less so chemistry because we assume that atoms all behave of the same element all behave the same way, up to ionization, whatever. But in biological systems and social systems, you just have so much more variation in what the things that are in interacting in your system that the kind of reductive logic that works in physics doesn't. Which leads me to one bad example that is also from my pet hate field, sociophysical modelling. Ah, yes. <laughs> the computer says you should be happy with this slop. Why aren't you happy? Why aren't you clapping? Is sociology one of those ones invented by the Nazis? No, that's criminology. Uh, I fucked it up. <laughs> so no, we, we like sociology, but it's... Uh... Sociology was arguably invented by Marx. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. Which makes it unambiguously good. <laughs> but the specific example that I want to talk about here is a paper that I'm going to cite properly in the notes below if you want to go and Google at it which is modeling fear of crime in a community. This is specifically a what we call an agent-based model. So this models people as individuals with their own rules of behavior, interacting in a social network and an environment. So your person is represented as an agent with some While you're typing this out, fear of crime. I'll just, uh, in Baldur's Gate, one of the ways you can save on CPU, which I, my CPU is really struggling with the game, is you can turn off dynamic crowd modeling. Mm which does lead to funny situations where you are, in fact, murdering someone in the street and everyone will just stand around continuing to have conversations about their fucking toe rot or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Already I have some problems with this because fear of crime within this model is a number between zero and one. Right. With zero meaning no fear of crime and one meaning you are basically absolutely afraid of crime. There is no more fear that you can possibly have with regards to crime. The Spider-Man and... Um... I don't know enough comics to <laughs> pick out a coward character. Oh, this uh, paper was also sent to me by Josie Spicer, friend of the show, because she encountered it a long time ago in her criminology studies, and she thought it was sus at the time, <laughs> but we talked about it for about five hours, and then she was like, oh my god, this is stupid in ways I didn't even realize. <laughs> So, you have this person, a, an agent with some fear of crime. Their initial uh, level of fear could be randomly generated, I think it is. But in isolation, fear decays. In isolation, fear decays. Yeah, so it's kind of profound. 
sound is a statement. <laughs> <laughs> so what I mean by that is over time, an individual's level of fear drops if they are not interacting with other people and if they don't experience crime. Right. And it drops like like this. So it's decay over time. The rate at which it's dropping is decreasing. It kind of asymptotes to zero. Crimes happen randomly. Great. Yes. Good. Good. Uh-huh. Good. Good base assumption. <laughs> with some probability. And why would you say they've simulated the rate as being higher in certain neighbourhoods? <laughs> would you believe that that directly influences their proposals for public policy? Wow, incredible. Oh, it's so fucking good, dude. <laughs> like, oh, it's, it's so- also like, um, I think we have from a, at least like a political and sociological angle, uh, not sociological, but like uh, from a historic angle that neighbourhoods with low crime tend to fear crime more and vote along those lines. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Go back to the fucking basilisk. People with too much fucking free time. Yeah. <laughs> and Absolutely. They themselves by worry. Crimes happen randomly with some probability that can vary across groups. So you can have cr- uh, groups of the population that have a low crime incident, groups of the population that have a cri- re- high crime incident. But within those, the actual occurrence where a particular individual experiences a crime is random. When a crime happens to a person, fear goes to one. So if you've just had a crime happen to you, you are maximally afraid of crime. That doesn't make any goddamn sense. Well, no, it kind of does in a psychological... Look, so far this is perhaps the least problematic because we see we see evidence of people becoming hypervigilant in the wake of crime. That's true, but, That's I, fine. but I also... I am less worried about having my house burgled as somebody who has had my house burgled because the experience was... I mean, it was shitty, but now that it's happened to me, I... I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll lock the door more. Like, yes, my paranoia- but in the imme- Well, no, but I will say in the immediate aftermath of that happening, you were hypervigilant. I had nothing more to steal! <laughs> no, but that, that doesn't matter. You were still hypervigilant. So this, I, I don't think this is necessarily unreasonable. But, I mean, it's problematic, but it's the least unreasonable part of this so far. Surely, though, it depends on the crime, right? Oh, Imagine well, you, you see- you get regularly and you don't, you're like, it just, just happens to me. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I would like to point wallet. out that within this framework, all crimes are the same. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Incredible. So the last part of the dynamics before I start ragging on the actual emergent behavior here is that when two people interact- I can't wait for the end of the sentence. Their, their fear gets averaged. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Hell yeah. Have these people ever interacted with a single other person? No. Uh, and total increased. <laughs> yeah. Famously, I find that I become- more anxious and paranoid as I interact with people around the world. And well, when I'm isolated, I become far more normal. <laughs> so what what I mean by that is if you have two people interacting, one person has a higher level of fear than the other. Person whose fear is higher will drop a bit. Person whose fear is low will increase. But these are not the same. Like, the increase is more than the drop. People Which, who, who came up with this theory think that people talk like sims. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it gets better, right? They built this. They chose this. They are very explicit about that fact when they talk about the maths of the model. And what I think has happened here is that if they don't include that overall increase in the collective level of fear across the whole population, the fear just goes away. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> because their model is fucking oh, stupid, people right? form yeah, communities yeah. and sort of talk and... and well, no, they don't it. encode that, right? Yeah, they, of course oh, not. But I, yeah. I do like that they've had to add, they've just invented fear out of nowhere and said, oh, actually, this is intrinsic to the model because otherwise it doesn't justify funding the police more. Okay, so the, the broad sort of emergent behaviour that comes out of this is that if you remove the opportunity of people from high crime rate groups, so groups where they experience crime at a high rate, from interacting with people where that experience crime at a low rate, then overall the level of fear drops. Right, so you have to segregate these two groups. Yes, in <laughs> fact... It's the white flight uh, study. In the... I am shitting you not when I say that in this paper, they say it may be distasteful <laughs> to, to contemplate the implications of what our model shows, but in order to deal with the fear of crime over the population, it would nonetheless be useful for public policy to do so. So right. they literally build a model that... Okay, I don't even need to fucking see the simulation. I can tell you right now 
from this averaging an overall increase, yeah. that across the whole population, you are over time going to see a steady increase in the level of fear, modulo the actual incidence of the crime, right? Right, and, be- oh, and, and because and crime happens randomly... And nobody actually does the crime in this. Right, like, exactly. It's just a thing that happens for no reason. <laughs> well, also, like, equating all crimes as the same thing is so funny to me. Oh my god, it's so <laughs> bad. Anyway, so this is a fucking terrible model. For one thing, the notion of fear of crime being a number between 0 and 1 is fucking stupid. They justify this by pointing at research which asks how afraid are you of crime, which is usually on a Likert scale or something like that. Yeah, and so if your fear of crime gets all the way to 1, you suffer an affliction and you might uh, uh, yeah, yeah, this- you might have a heart attack if it goes to 2. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is an abuse of a Likert scale to start with. The idea of social interaction is dumb. Sure. The the model for the occurrence of crime is dumb. The assertion that fear decays in isolation. Yes. Wasn't one of the fear games literally called fear, colon, isolation? <laughs> Bro. I, I have been burgled once, but like when I was pickpocketed, that did not increase my fear of crime at all. But burglary, probably about the same thing. Maybe I was a bit more diligent about locking doors. Are you suggesting that that the actual crime has different impacts based on what sort of a crime it is? If you're one of the rare cases that are like sexually assaulted by someone that you don't know, that might add to your paranoia in a way that like so much of what they are claiming that their results support is just on the face of it farcical because what they are doing is so fucking stupid. (laughs) Yeah, white collar crime, I'm guessing, does not enter into this at all. Oh, well, you see, they are talking about violent crime, but what sort of violent crime? Well, all violent crime, because it's all indistinguishable. And the damage done by white-collar crime, or, I don't know, wage theft, doesn't factor into this. Well, it makes somebody good rich, so, you know, how bad can it be? <laughs> okay, this, yeah, this is so, this is so fucking stupid. you got a yes. stupid example? I like these ones. I do, actually. So, um, the next one is actually from Quantum Computing, which is not my field, so, you know, don't ask me any deep questions about it. I will reference the necessary papers below. This example is that there were claims of a uh, wormhole <laughs> built in a quantum computer. No, dude, for real, it's serious. Yeah. Wait, but we don't have quantum computers, right? No, we do. Oh, we do? They're just hard. Yeah, right. Yeah, we have quantum computers, they're just fucking hard to build and maintain. Yeah, fair enough. This is a bad simulation example in multiple ways. First of which is that the breathless media reporting about the fact that they actually created a wormhole is a lie because they were running a simulation of a wormhole on a quantum computer. (laughs) So this is a case where the media hype, which was in fact based on some of the claims of the people involved in the research, who were then disavowed by other people involved in the research because they said bullshit. So this is a case of a simulation study being misrepresented. Well, that's that's just classic science reporting. <laughs> well, I mean, it's also classic slightly inflated claims by a researcher. Yeah. But yeah, so this is a misrepresentation. I mean, fuck it. Make, you, make your research more interesting. Who cares? It's fun. <laughs> So what they did is they ran a an algorithm on a quantum computer that was said to simulate behavior that would lead to wormhole at the quantum level. So it's a simulation, it's not actually creating a wormhole in a quantum computer. Second, the simulation was bad. I remember if somehow you're a younger listener, which I highly doubt, there was a time where you could talk about something you did in a video game and an ambient adult could potentially believe you were talking about something in the real world. <laughs> oh my god, that was so fucking funny, yes. It's like I was talking about getting into a fight in RuneScape or something. Mm-hmm. And some adult said, oh, you, sorry, were you in a fight? Are you okay? And it's just, it's just that they, they, they had no ability to, or no... No uh, no context. Uh, no context. Yeah. For the fact that uh, the, this, this simulated engagement was not in fact real. And this is very funny when it happened then. It's funnier now. <laughs> yes. Journalists are still reporting on simulations like they're real things. If the quantum scientist comes to you as a reporter and says, I've built a wormhole in a quantum computer, you, you do scratch that, right? But to get the to get the article out the door, you publish what they've said. I'm just saying it's that- It's bad sh- reporting, but, you know, it, it's not entirely- Yeah, I'm wormhole. saying that maybe, um, as a journalist, you're the person who should be the most skeptical. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, on top of the fact that the, what they did was misrepresented, some part by themselves, the simulation that they used, like the algorithm- was a bad one and didn't uh, apparently, this is not my field, and apparently did not properly reflect the physical behavior that could produce a wormhole in the right conditions anyway. So this is shit on two levels, as opposed to what we saw previously, 
which was basically shit on the level of the research. We ran wormhole.exe and it made a wormhole. <laughs> Yay! Someone watched too many isekai fucking anime and, <laughs> and decided to like uh, bring it to life. Yeah. They were looking at too many black holes and saw the film Event Horizon. <laughs> <laughs> and decided this, wow, we need to we need to create this in real life. Well, no, that's the Rokos Basilisk people, actually. Oh, that's true. It, look, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of people in tech who are like, oh, this sci-fi concept that was awful? We should do that. I want to see if I can do that. To be fair, from a cool factor, I mean... Well, they don't think they're going to be the people grounded to dust. Right. right? That's the point. Yeah. Anyway, that is our bonus episode for the week, for the month, actually. Thank you, listeners, very much for paying for this. If you're not paying for this, please consider paying for it. I would very much appreciate the money, but would very much appreciate the money. Thank you both for coming on, and I'll talk to you next time. Talk to you then. Goodbye!